Let's hope you clap at the end too. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is tell you a little bit about how ICNC was created because you're going to go back and say, well, who are these people behind this thing? And you're going to have to explain it to people. Um, the overwhelming narrative that this all focuses down to is, uh, and Jenny knows it all too well, is that I'm a member of the CIA and this is entirely financed by the CIA. So let's start there and then work our way backwards. So here's some interesting bits of history, personal and otherwise. I met Jack Duvall in 1964. We were we were classmates at college, at Colgate University. It was a very beautiful college in upstate New York. As a matter of fact, he and I had a radio show uh, once a week where we talked about local politics. You didn't know that much, did you? Mm -hmm. Or you didn't know that? You did know that. I'd say, you know, we took a little, we did a little study and I'd say that our viewing, our listening membership never exceeded 10 and probably averaged about three or four. <laughs> but we had, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> they were they were committed. They were committed. That's right. <laughs> and um, then what happened is I went to uh, graduate school, the Fletcher School, and I'm a child of the late 1960s, which was a very disruptive period of time in the United States. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy was the. Uh, the Vietnam War was, uh, was uh, drafting a great deal of great numbers of young Americans and there was protests everywhere. And um, I graduated and went to the Fletcher School and at that time I was very interested like many, many people my age in, this, in the question of why in important conflicts those with the militarily superior position didn't necessarily win. And so it made me look at issues that were not military in character, psychological, economic, sociological, uh, strategic. And um, I took that interest over to a course I took with a man named Thomas Schelling at Harvard. Does anybody know who Thomas Schelling is? Yeah, well, uh, the predictable people. Tom Schelling won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2005. He, um, the reason why Erica raised her hand, and I did, is that he forwarded both of our books. And um, he devised the term mutually assur assured destruction as a way of helping the, two, the Soviets and Americans communicate about how to safely manage their nuclear stockpiles. And um, it, was, it sounds like a terrible thing, but at the same time, as a concept, but at the same time, it created boundaries of activity that were respected by both sides that, except you know, for cases like the Cuban Missile Crisis, but even then, really prevented and reduced the likelihood of war. But he was a thinker about conflict. He wrote a book called Strategy, Coalition, and Conflict that if you're people in my field is a, is a Bible, and if you go and speak to professors that are my age or a little bit younger, like Stephen, they'll be sitting on, inevitably, inevitably sitting on a bookshelf. So I came up to him and I told him about my interest in asymmetric warfare, why the winners are not those with the most military power. He said, well, that's sort of interesting. If you think um, that's interesting, why don't you study what happens when somebody wins even though they have no military power whatsoever but still beats somebody with considerable military power? I said, that sounds good. He said, good, I want you to meet a man named Gene Sharp who was at the Harvard Center at that time. And I met him and then he became my thesis advisor. Gene, as you know, wrote the book called The Politics of Nonviolent Action. It was is based on his thesis at Oxford and one of the most important books here um, from dictatorship to democracy is one that we spend a lot of time distributing for him and he's a great thinker on the subject and I enjoyed my time with him very much. Now when you really go back to the real origins of ICNC I really have to attribute it to one thing and I tried to explain this to Shaska this morning but I'll give you a try it's what's called carbon paper. Now, do any of you know what carbon paper is? <laughs> See, it's again an age-based thing. S since you can't just make copies with this stuff, what in my day, in the, when I was doing my thesis, if you wanted to make a copy of a thesis, you had to take carbon paper and stick it behind and, and, and smash through the carbon paper to create an impression. 
Now, why was this significant? Because Gene Sharp wrote a 1,600-page <laughs> book, and he insisted that I sort of equal him in length. And so I ended up writing the second longest dissertation at the Fletcher School, which was called Strategic, Aspect, Strategic Aspects of Nonviolent Resistance Movements. And I compared two cases, the Indian Independence Movement, which was a well thought through, well led uh, campaign, and the Indian Independence and the Russian, First Russian Revolution, which was very different. More of a ground up, unthought through, movement that ended up being co-opted by the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks in street brawls and with predictable results. And um, so this thesis that I wrote um, got to 1,100 pages. It was the second long, it still is the second longest thesis written at the Fletcher School. You know, by way of interest, the first longest thesis was written by a man named Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Does anybody here know who he is? Yeah, okay. So what about carbon paper and ICNC? Well, the fact was is that I used so much carbon paper and so much regular paper and spent so much time with my typist that uh, I basically went bankrupt. And um, that wasn't good. I made one other mistake, is that when I did the dedication to the thesis, I dedicated the, uh, this is like the Stockholm Syndrome, I dedicated the, <laughs> thesis to my typist, even though my wife had read the thing three times and offered tremendous. <laughs> so, by the way, I could not rectify that mistake until 18 years later, and I'll explain why. So I was sort of broke. So I said, well, I better get a job. So I went to Wall Street and spent 15 years there during a very exciting time where we were literally breaking down a great number of conventions about how the American business was financed. And a lot of the attitudes I had, I developed then, you know, I, I, I take to this work now. Um, but uh, during that period of time, Gene was no longer able to stay at Harvard, and he um, basically was going to Southeastern Massachusetts University, right. and he was, you know, it was 110 miles twice a week to lecture, and it was killing him, and so I had made some money at that point, and so we created the Einstein Institution, and the Einstein Institution went on for 10 years, and it basically, and still does, focuses around the work of Gene Sharp, and, um, and a lot of issues were hashed out about how we should basically uh, develop the research, who we should develop it with, how to attract other people who want to do this research and what we should be saying to dissidents around the world. And um, I finished my career in banking in 1990 and then and did, did quite well financially. And then I went to the International Institute for Strategic Studies to turn my doctoral dissertation, which is 1,100 pages, into a book, which was 450 pages. So the point I want to make to you all also is that it took me 18 years to basically reduce the size of this study by a third. And I went from, like just like every graduate student, 70 variables to determine success or failure, and I got it down to 12. 18 years later from then, I'm now down to three, which I'll share with you in a minute. And um, what happened was sort of discouraging at that point. So I wrote a book called Strategic Nonviolent Conflict, The Dynamics of People Power in the 20th Century. And I went from two cases to six cases, from 70 variables to 12. I had always, when I was in the middle of the banking, my banking career always wanted to write this book. I wrote it, Prager agreed to publish it. We took a big risk and printed 5,000 copies and I had to give 2,000 away to my best friends so otherwise we wouldn't sell the 5,000 printing out. So it wasn't a heck of a lot of demand, and I would go back to my old friends who I gave the book to and say later, well, what'd you think of the book? And they'd say, gee, Pete, it's awfully abstract, or they would say, it's sitting on my night table right below my John le Carre novel, which means never, ever speak to me about this subject again. In comes Jack, many years later, and says, you know, I want to introduce you, Jack was in public television, I want to introduce you to this man named Steve York. <laughs> 
Steve York says to me, well, geez, Pete, I read your book. And I said, oh, my God, an endangered species. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, no, I can turn this into a documentary. I said, go away. And he started pounding on me for a half a year. And, and I said, look, if you can do what I've tried to do in the book, to basically say, even though that these events happen at different times in different places, they're essentially the same story about what did, what did Shosky just talk about? Disruption with nonviolent discipline leads to defection. I'm in. So then we went to the US. Now, under the American system of public broadcasting, you have certain broadcasting key stations, like in Boston, New York, Washington, and, and uh, LA, and I think San Francisco. And to get into them, we needed a grant. So I went to the US Institute of Peace, and um, they, they gave me a grant, but on the following terms. If we give you this money, and you don't get on PBS, public broadcasting, we want the money back. <laughs> so I said, OK. And we got on public broadcasting. We created a force more powerful. And a force more powerful uh, told six stories, which you are well aware of. And that led to the creation of bringing down a dictator, then uh, the Orange Revolution. And now we're finishing a movie on what happened in Egypt. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But again, the same thesis. And this is part of ICN's, ICNC's work, is to basically illustrate it through the visual, visual media that there's these incredibly important conflicts and that they can be understood by comparing one to another. So what happened then is dissidents would come to us and say, well, gee, I saw what happened in this movie, and uh, I want to do the same thing. But you must understand, my situation is completely different. Our guy is more repressive. We have ethnic conflicts. You know, everything that Eric would tell you about that is a condition-based activity, they would tell you about Moan and Gronover. And we would say, OK, I get it. Of course, your, your situation's unique. But let's see what we can learn from these other cases, which offered you hope, and see if we could reverse engineer some of the principles of those cases to your situation. And people from many, t you know, probably ultimately now 40 or 50 countries came to us. And we learned we had to perfect how to speak to them. But more importantly is we had to take the battle of ideas to other constituencies. And that meant academia. It meant the media. It meant the think tank communities. It meant policymakers. Because if you didn't have a holistic approach to how to convene these ideas in the general themes that we're talking about, you'd fail because there'd always be somebody saying, well, it really isn't what Peter or his group ICNC says it is. So ever since I've been in this work, oh, uh, let me give you a postscript. The great news is that 18 years later when I published Strategic Nonviolent Conflict, I created a a, a, a thank you page, a dedication page, and my wife was on it, except the day before they were about to print, they told me we couldn't, they didn't have, they weren't going to be able to print the page. I said, if you don't print the page, I might as well commit suicide because my <laughs> wife will kill me. But the, um, but I made, but I righted a terrible wrong of 18 years and the book came out. Now, but ever since I've been involved with this subject, and you're going to have the same problem, you enter a battle of words. Now, you probably see this in your, your own experience, where you talk about a peach, and then people have a mango in mind. It's just the funny. The mind shifts. They hear something, and they say, oh, you mean the following. So let's talk about the oh, you mean. So I say civil resistance is what people do when they're living under oppression. They have no military options, so they use strikes, boycotts, mass protests to create disruptions that ultimately lead to defections and delegitimatize the authoritarian that makes their ability to be their, their governance so unacceptable. And the listener says, oh, you mean pacifism. And then my answer is, well, you can be a pacifist, but nonviolence, which is what a pacifist basically embraces, is not a strategy for uh, eliminating uh, for eliminating the, uh, the, the problem you have with your adversary. Or they say, oh, you mean conflict resolution. We say, no, we're, this isn't about negotiation. It's not about uh, preventing a conflict or resolving a conflict. It's about being in the middle of a conflict when you can't, we have issues that can't be 
resolved. And they say, oh, you mean protests. I said, no, that we're talking about something more profound than protests. In the case of Kusta, it's a consumer boycott. And in the case of Poland, it's a solidarity movement. It's a whole range of subjects. Now, th this is all what you've been, and let me do the last one. Oh, and, it, and these things are always spontaneous. That's the one I always get from the policy community. Because if they can't manage it, they don't want to believe it exists. It's a really terrible problem, and I'm going to speak, speak a little more about this. So you're going to encounter this too. Now, I'm incredibly grateful that you've come, and I hope that this, um, this experience that you're having is, is, is well worth your while, but you have to give something back. So when people, and what I want you to give back is when you hear this, oh, you mean, you, you've really got to be pretty tough and, and because ideas matter, they get transmitted, and this is a real battle. And this is what happened in Syria. You know, how many times did the Syrian Free Army say, oh, nonviolence doesn't work? Because in their mind, when you say civil resistance, they hear, and this is common all over the world, they hear pacifism. It's, it, it costs lives. So let me get back to the money part for a second. So I was a banker for many years, and you all probably have your own views of bankers. When I say I was a banker, the listener might say, oh, you mean these money-grubbing, <laughs> horrible people <laughs> that basically would sell out their mother for a dollar. And I said, well, think of it that way. That's okay. You know, I was one of those, and, you know, that's fine. But, um, but let me mention something that you might not know. There's a purity in what investors and bankers do that the people who judge them are not willing to do. And it's from that discipline that um, I think we need to take some experience in education. The only way you make money on Wall Street is by taking a dollar and making it worth something more. And the only way you can do that is by um, Understanding that every time you take a dollar, you have a set of assumptions about what might happen. And some of the assumptions are good outcomes, less good, poor, and horrible <laughs> outcomes. And what you have to do is assess those assumptions as clinically as you can, meaning without emotion, and then put probabilities on them and create something called expected value. So, Let's say we put up a dollar and we think about this investment might have certain kinds of outcomes. A great one might be it turns into two dollars. A good one might be it turns into a dollar fifty. A neutral one is a dollar, a poor one is it loses. And here you lose a dollar. So poor is you lose fifty cents and really bad is you lose a dollar. Now you can conjure in your own mind what these outcomes may be, but the art of investing is to say, what are the probabilities of any of these outcomes happening? So you can have one series where you say the great outcome 20%, the good outcome 20%, the neutral outcome 20%, the poor outcome 20%, the horrible outcome 20%. You multiply those by the number and add them up and you get 60 cents. So you put up a dollar and get 60 cents. Bad thing to do. Don't do it. Or you could have another set of outcomes and the probabilities. One is a 50% probability of two, 40% of one and a half, zero of neutral, a 10% chance of a 50 cent loss, and no chance of all losing all your money. You add them up and you get $1.75. That's worth doing. Now, why is that relevant to us? So let me show you why. And in comes the work that our academics have done, and particularly the breakthrough work of Erica and others. So what do we see here? We have, I'm sorry to basically uh, plagiarize from you, but I'm making a point here. We learn a lot about expected value from this work. Major nonviolent campaigns have achieved a 53% success rate compared to 26%. The success rates, as we see, are skewed very much, success is very much more likely versus violent, nonviolent campaigns. A partial success skewed again towards 
nonviolent campaigns and failures skewed horribly the other way. Okay? Then what we else we learn, which is sort of cool, is that, as Erica said, that as we go further and further and closer and closer in time from 1900 to today, those ratios are skewed even more and more in the favor of a civil resistance movement. <coughs> I did a study in, um, with Freedom House, we did, and an ICNC did, and we learned that in 50 of 67 transitions between 72 to 2005, nonviolent civil, civic resistance was a key factor. In other words, it was very, very critical to those outcomes. And transitions that were led by nonviolent civic resistance groups led to greater increases in freedom. Of the 50 transitions above, 32, 64% led to higher levels of respect for political rights and civil liberties. And then if you look at the, oh, by the way, the reason, the, the data we used for the Freedom House study is that they publish a book called Freedom in the World Every Year. You're aware, of, some of you are aware of it, where they take political rights and civil liberties and they give you a one to seven ranking. And by the way, does anybody know who's been in every single year a double seven? Yes. Who's not here? What country's not represented today? It's North Korea. Korea. Right. Okay. So what we see here, movements driven by civil resistance, high probabilities of better freedom scores, um, driven by top-down initiatives, negotiations, very less likely, and then the ones driven by this, com this combined element, very li unlikely to lead to a good result. Partly free, dominated by transitions from uh, top-down negotiations, and not free, dominated by these combined efforts. So we have another set of probabilities that indicates a, an ability to talk about expected value. And then this is the one that I think is the most interesting of them all. I don't know, did you show this one, Erica? This one basically says that even given the extreme outperformance of, of, at the moment the campaign is on of successful versus non-successful campaigns, even a failed campaign five years later has an extraordinary chance of being successful versus a virtually nil chance of a violent campaign. Now the reason for that is pretty obvious, you've already learned it, is because participation creates its great knockdown effects over time. So we sit here and say to ourselves, hmm, we can make a choice at any particular point in time. We could be Syrians in 2011, we could be, and we, said, and we say, well, okay, um, every one of these conflicts, the 323, these people thought, we should expect, these people thought that it was a unique circumstance, unique to them, and it probably was. And those who chose a violent insurrection uh, had a 26% chance of success. Think about great, good, neutral, poor, and horrible. And the success, and by the way, the other piece of data that's here is that the civil resistance movements have a 10 times greater chance when they succeed of being democracies than violent insurrections. So the chances of having a great success is defined by a democratic result with a with a violent insurrection is knocked, is, is hit in two ways. First, only a 26% chance of success. Um, still, when they succeed, unlikely to be democratic. And when they fail, which is 74% of the chance, you're in a terribly hellish position. Versus another choice, which has a 53% chance of success. Mo and that success is likely to be great because it's highly likely to lead to a democratic result, particularly if there's high levels of participation. And if things don't work out so good, what you see here is your failed campaign can even end up in the success if you could stay, have the staying power. We also learned from America that these movements last two and a half years. So I, I had this talk with Dahlia, I sort of previewed it. And what I'm going to say now that is very important is that there's a difference between people being in the morally right position and people making a decision with poor expected value. The nicest people make bad decisions about expected value and sometimes the worst people make good decisions. They're separate issues. But if you really look at the probability set in 2011 and when we were approached by the opposition at the end of 2011, who now were being essentially tossed aside by the Free Syrian Army, uh, 
and said, well, what can we do to basically stay relevant in this campaign? Because they basically threw us aside and said, oh, you guys are essentially pacifists. Nonviolence doesn't work. You know, and somebody had to be able to confront both sides and say, well, let's do an expected value analysis. How can you not do that? How can you not do that? How can you not compare the likely outcomes, the probabilities of those outcomes, the values associated with the outcomes, and add it up and say one is better than the other? That was never done. The business of what we do here, if there's any bit of business that's worthwhile, is to ask you to submit to those disciplines and at least try to inject them in the conflicts you're involved with because it will save lives. <laughs> so, now, let me show you, make a point. One of the great political scientists of our time is Sam Huntington. And in 1984, he said, democratic regimes that, have, that last have seldom, if ever, been instituted by mass popular action. The work that we've done since then has basically proved him to be completely wrong. So we've had a tremendous movement in thought about this subject, and we need to capitalize on it. We also know, which is, uh, which is what I think... Uh, Eric was mentioning with respect to the Marchand study that was done with Freedom House is that all these prior conditions that basically sh seem to people to shroud or contain the probabilities of success really are not there. So we can, when we get back to the expected value, we can think differently about the probabilities of certain outcomes. And these, based on this, what you see here, we can assume that the arguments that, that argue for poorer results of a nonviolent resistance movement are based on conditions. But if conditions are less important, you're more likely to basically place higher probabilities on the result of a civilian resistance movement, especially if you can orient people to understand that these movements on average take two and a half years. I can't tell you how many times I've heard comments like by, from foreign policy people, well, civil resistance takes too long. Well, I was in the middle of a Council on Foreign Relations Task Force in 2004 about how to create a better negotiating environment for a nuclear problem. And now we're into 2013, nine years later, and they're still talking about the same negotiating strategies. When we talked about civil resistance, their comment was, well, we don't want to study that because that's regime change. Well, they've been nine years gnawing on the same bone when a civil resistance movement on balance takes less than a, almost a quarter of the time. So, getting back to my mentor, Tom Schelling, if conditions don't matter to outcomes, they're not dispositive, and as, as we've told you, that really it's skills that are the critical thing, we can then assess our probabilities by, by virtue of understanding how skillful we are. You can't just say skills are more important than conditions without defining what is skillful. You can't say, you know, my son is a wrestler. He was an internationally ranked wrestler. And you can't say you're a great wrestler because you have lots of muscles and you've read lots of books. It's, it's, it's the interactive element and the things you think about in the middle of the contest that are great. And, and it's all about basically honing skills. So, for example, I think I'm, I don't know if I had a chance to mention it yesterday is, um, yeah, I talked about this, um, this chess master who basically spent years and years and years doing computer chess to basically figure out all the ways he could lose. This is why we like the game. But the point is, is that if it's not conditions, it must be something else. And I just want to read to you what Tom Schelling wrote in 1964 in an edited book called Civilian resistance and national defense. And this is really what's motivated me all these years. So the tyrant and his subjects are in somewhat symmetrical positions. They can deny him most of what he wants. They can, that is, if they have the disciplined organization to refuse collaboration. And he could deny them just about everything they want. He can deny it by using the force at his command. They can confront him with chaos, starvation, idleness, and social breakdown. But he confronts them with the same thing, and indeed most of what they deny him they deny themselves. And here's the key point. It is a bargaining situation in which either side, if adequately disciplined and organized, can deny most of what the other wants, and it remains to see who wins. So with every unit of activity, you create costs with your opponent and costs with yourselves. It's the distribution of those costs that determine who wins and who loses. The distribution of costs 
in a military campaign or in a civil resistance campaign is based on skills. And that's why I want to talk a little bit more in a more granular way of what skills are. So if you're going to talk about skills, you have to be able to say, well, what is a, and, and, and speak about them in a way that, that has credibility, you have to start talking about, well, what does it mean to have a skillful violent insurrection? And what does it mean to have a skillful civilian-based resistance? So let's look at the common view of the battlefield. We have a leadership that we have here in black that can't be, that is not going to defect. They're there to the bitter end. It's like Kim, 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 Il, Kim Jil-un or in, in Korea, that family, they're not. Then you have elites and you have pillars of support that we've mentioned before in a general population. Now the theory of a violent insurrection is that you get guerrilla forces between the population and these pillars, <coughs> highly athletic young men, well armed, and their job is to keep shooting until they kill as many people in these pillars and the elites until they make it to the top of the leadership board. At some point, they assume that the equation, since they usually start from a militarily inferior position, they assume that some of their military on the other side will defect and that equation will right itself. Um, and that's not likely to happen, so here's the risk. The risk is, is that the military then, uh, then the elites and the pillars look to the military to basically protect them against the guerrillas threat to their lives and they sort of circle the wagon and the military stops the guerrilla forces. There's no shifting of loyalties amongst the military and, um, and the imbalance remains and the military basically counterattacks, kills the guerrilla forces and creates obviously great collateral damage in the population. The fact that this shift in military power doesn't occur or is unlikely to occur is the reason why you have a 26 percent success rate. Now let's look at civil resistance, the theory. Um, you have a leadership again non-reconstructable but within the elites and within these pillars you have what Natan Sharansi calls latent double thinkers, people who are not equally loyal who basically if given the right circumstances would find it attractive from a risk return point of view, their own expected value, to basically defect in the general population. The idea that as long as you maintain nonviolent discipline, these pillars and the elites will separate more and more from the leadership. Ultimately, as you see in all our movies, the military to some extent will defect. They will submit themselves to the, uh, to the uh, citizens uh, and um, the leadership will recognize, like was the case of Milosevic, that he has no capacity to move the military and usually what happens is that the authoritarian leaves. Okay, now let me get to, um, so the question is, you wake up every day and you have to ask yourself, well, what, 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 how do I organize my decision making? How do I organize my thinking about these, about the conflict I'm in? And here, I want to offer a little different kind of formulation than you've heard before that basically takes off on the way military people think about how to organize and construct a conflict. And so they think about what they do in terms of choices. And so the grand strategic choice is what is the goals of the conflict, who's the leadership, and for a civil resistor, the key element of decision making is to create uni unity around goals and leaders. By the way, if anybody wants this PowerPoint, I'd be glad to leave it with them. The authoritarian's job is to co-opt enough people so that unity never is created. And if you look at our movie on bringing down a dictator, you can see that one of the reasons Milosevic stayed in power so long is he was constantly co-opting the opposition one way or another. Then you have the tactical set of questions is what kind of disruption? And we have talked a lot about all the various kinds of tactics, you know, 198 methods. And the, and the way to split them I particularly like is acts of commission, which are acts that you do that, you want, that the opponent wants you to stop doing, or acts of omission where you stop doing acts that the others want you to continue doing. I think that's an interesting way to divide, but we're, gonna, we're keeping on working about how to create an effective tactical map. But I like that because <coughs> By dividing them that way, you describe the, the nonviolent tactics in a format that begs the question about how 
the authoritarian has to respond. He has a different kind of response against the consumer boycott, as we saw with the movie with Kusta, than he does against a protest. And the authoritarian's goal here is to suppress via violent acts of repression or threats of terror. And then you have logistical decisions to be made, which has to do with capacity building. Now, one of the things you'll hear, for example, and I don't want to spend much time on it, that, you know, that Egypt was a Facebook revolution. That just wasn't true. But what is the role of technology? But when you really think of the correct role of technology, it's basically at this logistical level, creating capacities for the kind of tactical choices that the civil resistors want to make. Now, offensive cap capabilities are communication systems, strike funds, the things that Maria talked about yesterday that can be provided from the outside. And defensive has to do with human rights people naming and shaming, providing medical services, providing um, economic, uh, sub, you know, economic, uh, 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 economic uh, counters to the loss of jobs and whatever may happen, like strike funds, as I said before. The authoritarian's response is capacity destruction, shutdowns, and using technology which you use to, the same technology you use to communicate with people can be used, as you well know, for tracking and other purposes. Now, all of that is united into this concept of planning. To basically work up and down this ladder of choices, to think through exactly what is the optimal choice at any particular time. The authoritarian's job is to basically react to each one of those strategic initiatives, and that's where the contest is really at its force. So you come with these choices, and how do you evaluate a good choice versus a bad choice. So let's spend a second talking about that. Now what I'm going to do is something that's very graphic. I don't want to make more of it than it is, but it's a useful way of thinking about what I'm describing now. So if you look at the upper right-hand quadrant, you have a civil resistance strategy, and you have the authoritarian on the lower left counter strategy. The civilian resistance basically has tactics for disruption, and basically the result is hopefully defection. In the lower quadrant, you have tactics for repression and the hope by the authoritarian is levels of obedience. So the best choice, every choice you make, you want in the upper right-hand quadrant, what you want that choice to have is the least amount of disruption for the most amount of defection. Does that make sense? The least amount, that's what Tom Schelling said, 54. The least amount, he said, you know, the least amount of disruption disruption for the most amount of defection. Disruption because of the movement. Yeah, well, in the society, remember, because what Tom Schelling says, when you disrupt the, the society, you disrupt yourself. There's a cost to you in the disruption as well. Do you get yeah, A strike costs everybody money, right? <coughs> okay. So part of this is in the design of how you design it. For example, Kusta, you had alternate sources of supply before you went out on a boycott. So part of it is in the design, but you have to be able to plan and say, what tactics do I, every time I take a step, there's going to be an equation between disruption and defection. Now on the other side, you have to be able to say, well, what is going to be the authoritarian's response? Well, what you want the authoritarian's response to be, the maximum amount of repression for the least amount of obedience. You want the effect of repression to go down and down and down in terms of creating obedience for the opposition. Now let's look at the authoritarian strategy. The authoritarian wants a civil resistor have to basically create the maximum amount of disruption for the least amount of defection because that makes it harder and harder to continue a nonviolent resistance movement. And the authoritarian wants minimal amounts of repression to have maximum amounts of obedience. And as we talked about, and I was talking to Erica the other day, is that at some point when the repression gets so great you get a reverse effect, which is what I call backfire, where the repression actually, increments of repression actually leads to more defections. It could be outrage or whatever spawns that. There's literature on that subject. So if you think of each one of these decisions you make and each one of the decisions the authoritarian makes. Yeah, can I just show this alternative? I mean, I think there's also situations where the regime profits from maximizing repression, right? So, I mean, it's... Right. And so this would, I mean, 
and then to say that the ideal situation for the regime is minimum protection, maximum obedience, but in a situation where they're also profiting, benefiting from the repression, then you'd also have, I mean, an alternate. Remember, ideal. this is not amounts, this is ratio. So if they profit, if, if, if their increments of repression lead to greater and greater obedience, or that, and, and to the point where a population is terrorized, this is not the amount of repression, this is the consequence. So as you get more repression and that creates less obedience, you start to get backfire, and so there's a danger there. So then the question is, you take this, these calculations and you get into a sequence, and you could go down two roads, where A minus C, so to go back, you know, you have A minus C, you're going along that track, this A to C, or you're going to the D and B track, which is this track. Whichever track you on, over time, basically leads to more defection, more obedience, and that it's a bargaining situation, as Tom Schelling, and it depends. But at the end of the day, you want the disruption to beat the repression rather than the repression to beat the disruption. So let me, um, let me stop here, um, and I'll take any questions, but let me, let me also conclude with one other thing, because we'll get back to the money part. When you leave here, people are going to say, well, how is this financed? And I, I usually don't like to talk about this, but, oh, I do have one more thing I want to say. Um, let me leave that for a second. So if we can define a skillful campaign of civil resistance, we should also be able to define the capabilities that are more likely to create skillful decision making than not. So let me leave you with this thought that there are really three. A successful civil resistance is like, must be capable of unifying around goals and leaders. Too many people just get out in the streets and they minimize. The Occupy movement may have been an authentic movement in downtown New York, but if you ask any of them what are your goals, they couldn't tell you what their goals were. The key, and this is in Erica's data, is to maximize civilian participation. The beauty of tactics of commission and omission and that variation of your portfolio of tactics is that it involves people willing to take different kinds of risks. And then you have to be involved with the capacity to plan for defections from the adversary. That's what the game is about. That's what this expected value is about. That's what the material I showed you is about. Now, if it's possible, how am I doing for time? Uh, 12 minutes, you think? Okay, I'll be done in a few minutes. So if these capabilities are there, what can the outside do? And I look at it a little bit like, what, what is the kind of intervention that makes sense from the outside? I look at it a little bit like the game of golf. A caddy doesn't swing the golf club. But a caddy can tell you how far away the hole is, what the windage is, what, what kind of grip to take. It can work with your swing. It can comment on your swing. But ultimately, the golfer, which in this case is the indigenous movement, has to make the swing. So here's the things that, so what we're exploring right now, and we did this last week in Poland, is, is there a doctrine that we can formalize about the rights of outsiders or the responsibility of outsiders to protect, to assist, in campaigns of civil resistance. And so what would the assistance include if we see what the capability needs are? The first is leadership training, which is a bit what we're doing here. Things that inhibit repression, these are all the things that Maria mentioned, provisioning of resources, and coordinating defections. And then the doctrine, if it's to be successful, has to address who to assist, when to assist. In other words, would you assist a group that's basically not committed to nonviolent discipline? I don't think so. When to assist? You know, my attitude is anytime you ask assistance by people who basically are committed to a campaign of civil resistance. What kind of assistance? Well, it's capability development, which we saw in this one, two, three, four above. And then how do we deal with issues of sovereignty? Because what always comes back is, oh, you guys are just outside regime changers. And the the doctrine that's being floated back that basically right now has better currency is not R2A, but NR2A, no right to assist. And that doctrine is prevailing in the world today, and it is led to what happened in Egypt, and it's got to be countered. It's not acceptable, in my opinion, for the world to take a passive view about that. Okay, so there's the thing. So let me make one more comment. So when you go away, um, 
uh, you want to know who finances ICNC. It's pretty simple. Um, my family finance, has financed every dime of ICNC, and the reason for that is that if we took a dollar from any government, any labor union, any philanthropy, any corporation, somebody would make the effort to say that dollar really came from the CIA. Now the beauty of a family financing this, even though I don't like to disclose what our family invests in philanthropically, is that you have to make a report to the IRS about ICNC and the sources. So you could go look up on the IRS and say all this money came from this family. And it's had a tremendous salutary effect in shutting up people who are, I would say, the useful idiots to those who want to propose an NR 2 way program, want to say, oh, they're really from the CIA. I've gotten that for years. And so this is a counterattack to that. I'll now stop and answer any questions you'd like. a bit like game theory um, and it, I'm, so I'm curious um, if, if you're aware how sort of game theory from, from economics has been used to, to analyze situations in civil resistance because it does a lot of similarities. Yeah, saying. that's sort of where my focus is. It's right. all about game theory. But it's only one approach. You should study many approaches. But what I love about game theory now uh, is that it's been forti the, the work I've done has been fortified because game theory is all about the interaction of expected value. But if you don't have the data to basically create the probabilities, even if you know the value, you can't, you know, it's a half a conversation. So I've had half a conversation until my friends here basically have done this incredible research. The whole idea behind what we're doing is everybody's building on everybody's knowledge. They're, an open dialogue, a sharing of information, look to our website, the use of information, the perfecting of our knowledge. I'm very interested, I've told Eric and others, to really understand a little bit more about defections and how defections could be in, 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 induced. I'm going to be speaking twice, one to a National Academy of Engineers and out at Stanford about how to think about technology. Because the technology that we think about, which is everybody goes on your that doesn't basically, that's one thing, but there's, it's not necessarily conducive to creating the disruption you're hoping for because it has an insularity when you go on your computer that, that's not necessarily helpful. Ah! Очень много читали книжек американских военных, которые описывали, каким образом они ну, воевали там, в Перхарбл и в других местах. И как ни странно, вот эти книжки нам в чем-то помогают. My comment may seem strange to you, but uh, interestingly, when uh, working on our strategy and tactics for the defense of Himke Forest, our uh, non-violent strategies, we read up a lot on the books uh, written by U.S. military and uh, the analysis of how different wars and campaigns were fought, including Pearl Harbor, were very helpful to us. Why is that strange? That's validation of what we're talking about. So good for you. We, we hope we can give you materials that are more relevant. That's what we're doing. <laughs> uh, just to, to, to probably relate to what you said, um, uh, we have this argument with my folks, and we say, okay, if we use game theory, if we have the resources, and people want to take up arms, we we'll simply just play the game, and then call the chase, and do the, the probable end they will actually get. So in your experience, um, what has been so difficult for people to 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 embrace or to chew and take to nonviolence. Well, first we would appreciate you not using the word nonviolence because it's the equivalent of pacifism. If we could just use the discipline of not using the term nonviolence as a noun, but talk about it as an adjective that describes lots of tactics: nonviolent resistance, nonviolent conflict. Will save lives over time. I don't. I, I'm look. I, I use language very, very loosely, but in my experience, you know, they say, "Oh, you mean nonviolence? How can you game theory nonviolence?" 
you know, you see what I'm saying? So th I'd be careful about that word. But let me get back. Give me back to your, give me the question. Okay. In your experience, why? Because there are occurrences where, um, I mean, situations where the same people uh, use violence. Uh, we saw in the case of NC, we've seen in the case of Syria. So I am asking you, in your experience working with people around the world like this, this time is us, what has been their strongest argument to not want to use non-violent approach? Well, some kind of analysis like this. Look, uh, again, I, 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 I use Syria with respect, but the unfounded assumptions behind how those events evolved from 2011 to early 2012. I, I'm on the board of the Council on Foreign Relations, and we sat with one of the most senior people in the United States in foreign policy, and, and they were talking about Syria. And uh, I said, well, why aren't you doing more to encourage the civil resistance movement? And they said, well, Pete, we've read your stuff, but why should we? Because Assad will be gone in two months. Now, that's, uh, Assad will be gone in two months. Now, this is my point. You, investment bankers and investors, you know, I can talk humorously about how grubby they are and terrible and, and you know, greedy and all that, but at least they have accountability. There was no accountability there, and that decision, that thought, basically was a horrible mistake. If they would have said to the Syrian Free Army, stand down, let's devise a civil resistance strategy, which over time we will help you with, I guarantee you, without equivocation, and you simply cannot argue differently, we would have a better result than we have now. So you've got to, you've got to demand, if you're going to use violence, you've got to give me an expected value. That's the one thing you can demand from people. It's immoral to use violence without going through that exercise. And that's what I think you can argue. What are you going to get from this? What are the probabilities of the outcomes? Define the outcomes. What do you think your opponent's going to do in response? What kills me is that the Americans are now say, thinking about arming the opposition as though, so because their end game is Assad to fall. Now, if they've learned anything in Iraq, do you think the Alawite Syrians are going to stand up and submit? You tell me, it's going to go on forever, won't it? Or, I don't know. Yeah, it will go. It's, it's horrible. So, Hardy. Just a quick comment, Les. Um, in addition to everything Peter's saying, which I, I completely agree with, other aspects of making the argument, if indeed you're having an argument with someone about violence and nonviolence, include obviously picking the right term to refer to civil resistance. For example, I have a friend who did a workshop with former Burmese guerrillas. And in the jungle, when he said, I'm going to give you a workshop on nonviolent action, they said, we're not interested. A few days later, he came back and said, I'd like to give you a workshop on political defiance. And they said, well, listen. And he gave the same workshop. So <laughs> defining your terms, it's true. This is a true story. You have to find the term to resonate with your audience. You need the data. You also, oftentimes, need to find historical examples. And one of the things that we find when we look is that there are historical examples in virtually every country and culture around the world, many of which have been buried or not discovered or not told, that need to be retold that says, see, this is our culture that does this. This is not some construct from the outside. So you mix the terminology, the data, the empirical results, the cases from one's own country, and you create a very powerful argument. Let me take Diane and Dan. Uh, is, is Jenny still here, Mona? Is she left? What's that? She stepped out. Okay. Because the same thing will happen to Jenny. You know, the Americans pick winners and losers. They, they thought the opposition would Svangarai. They didn't like him, and so now they think it's a failed deal. And, you know, they create the, the, their own illusions and swim in them. Anyway, um, da, uh, Dahlia, please. Um, in cases where civil resistance did initially work, but then mm -hmm. so, I mean, there was a coup or that, and then it failed. Like in the, I mean, I, I know I keep going back to Sudan. That was an example, 85, we had civil resistance, over for the government, blah, 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 elections, democratic, prime minister, and then two years later, a coup, which we're still suffering from, we're still under the rule of the military. So where does the theory come in then? Well, then, then, then you're back to the same construct uh, that I put up there. You know, you have a leadership, and it creates its own pillars of support, and the, and the battle continues. It's, there's no end game. The beauty of a civil resistance movement is 
it, particularly if it can be helped on the outside so that you can moderate, use it to the outsiders to moderate repression, is you can stay in the game for a long period of time. And as opposed to a violent insurrection where you get wiped out and, and uh, for long periods of time you can do nothing. There's a book written by Paul Behrman called Power and the Idealist, where he quotes Bernard uh, Kirchner's uh, grandfather, who was, uh, who was Jewish and uh, was under threat from the Nazis and said everyone deserves a D-Day. You know? Everyone, no matter where they are, and whatever threat they're facing deserves to have soldiers land on a beach come to rescue them, regardless of their political orientation. That is a very strong statement. It's one that we talk about R2A and how R2A doesn't exist, but with the appointment of Samantha Power and this idea of kinetic R2A or armed R2A, armed <coughs> right to assist, like in Benghazi, um, this has been a long process over decades of people entering the administration and institutions of power uh, where we see the military intersecting with humanitarianism in a way. And so I think that this, what's so great about ICNC and about classes like this is that starting a long process, a long march that will lead to more people entering institutions. I, there's a lot of focus on external activism and and agitation from the outside is to, but I think it's also extremely important that people also remain open to entering institutions so they can change it from the inside. And I think that the momentum that, that you, like Gene Sharp has started and that you've started and that continues and that will continue to evolve is extremely important. It's gonna be, it's gonna take decades to really get there. Well, let's talk about the difference between R2P and what we're talking about here. Let's take Libya. In Libya, Samantha Powers, who's written a wonderful book and is now a powerful person in the administration, claimed that there was going to be a holocaust in Benghazi defined as 10,000 people being killed. The French, who have their own agenda in Libya, said, that sounds good to me. And the administration, which wants to be part of a military operation in NATO that they don't lead said, well, this is a new model, let's go, go for it. So they went to the, based on that characterization of what might happen, they went to the UN or whoever they went to and got an approval to basically create a military response. The result. Oh, by the way, as part of that, the assumption is that, that the, the population was supine, the existing civil resistance movement, which Steve can talk about, is irrelevant, and, um, and it's all based on what outsiders do to make the situation different. Enter the military, and Russia, who signed on to this, is now seeing that this isn't what they signed on to because this is all about regime change, because it went quickly from protecting the people in Benghazi to basically facilitating the overthrow of Gaddafi because to the Americans and the French, once the military started, it was unthinkable that the result would be that Gaddafi, who threatened the Holocaust, could stay in power. So it went quickly to regime change. And if you actually listen to the estimates of the number of people dead, they exceed the people that we were supposedly protecting by somewhere between three to five times. Now, and by the way, the prospect for democracy is not so good. One of the great things about looking at the four major countries in the Arab Spring, and, you can, and what you find is a confirmation of the studies that Erica did and others have done that I did, we did with Freedom House. So you take the ones most likely to have a democratic result from Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Syria, and then you rank the level of violence in each and you get uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Syria. So that correlation between levels of violence and levels of freedom in a transition still holds true. And I think you've done more studies. There have been other cases that are really pretty well confirmed, the data, too, post-2006. One of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that uh, this is when you hold constant other factors that are associated with democratization. So things like GDP per capita, region of the world, and other factors that most comparative politics scholars think of as independently affecting democracy. So even when we control for all of those, we sort of isolate the likeliest candidates, the civil resistance campaign, they're still more likely. 
And the other thing is, you know, you were talking about this this matter of having, you know, you're twice as likely to to succeed if it's nonviolent and half as likely to succeed if it's violent. And one of the things that I have that's kind of a question for me is that where nonviolent campaigns don't work, that is where they fail, can violent resistance work at all? Right? So in those 26% of successful violent campaigns, none of them kind of gave civil resistance a good two and a half year try before turning to violence. Right? So there's, there's kind of a, a problem where, where violent resistance often kind of comes in too early in the process and subverts any ability for nonviolent resistance to work. And so that's why you get people who want to push back on you saying, Nonviolent resistance didn't work in our case, and and one question to ask them is, well, how long did you try it, and what did you try? I mean, did you just do demonstrations once a week, or did you actually like, you know, shuffle around the methods? So, so you know, these are ways, Laz, that that one can push back against those critiques. <coughs> Saying, I think one of the things that people just get distracted with when we talk about resistance, we talk about it in abstract, and we don't say resisting what. So in the idea, most, more often than not, that the regimes actually use nonviolent ways of oppression. It was one of them, one of the most, I mean, like, success or, or attempts that the regime of America later on the military in Egypt tried to do it was alongside even with the violence, the whole approach to isolate the, the, the activists from the rest of the society, and, and also isolate the, the, the activists from each other. So I remember at the time, it's like they were actually starting to just propagate all these things of how this, the, they're stopping the wheel of the industry, and how they are bringing the country down, and how they are looting and whatever. And at the same time, they literally started to, to build walls around the career square. I mean, like, it, it actually turned it into something that is physical, that they want to isolate the, the, the activists. And this is where tactics that are nonviolent or resistance that is, like, more creative and strategic works best in combating that is the idea of communication and, and conveying the message, having a, a campaign in Egypt that's called Kazibun or Liars, where people started creating a, a, a very amateur video of the atrocities of the military and the regime against the protests. And they could just take a small projector and go around the villages in Egypt and show the that. That is, that is a way of resistance. It's like resisting what? Resisting the lies, resisting the way of the approach to, to isolate the people. And at the same time, again, I mean, I remember at one, one point we were in the Rear Square, and what they did is like, like intensively bond, bond us with tear gas. This first is switch off all the lights that every one of us on the road thought that everyone's gone. But the amazing thing is that we started tweeting to each other, we're still here. We're still here and we're just saying this like there is a point where we all can gather. So it's it's there it is important when we think about the, the, the word resistance, we don't talk about it in abstract, it's like understand resisting what. And based on that is we develop a strategy to resist that in a certain way. Yeah, um, no, we all talked, but often there is this pretty trendy notion of the horizontal uh, protest, uh, the protest with no reason, uh, but uh, with uh, no, and also the protest which is like the protest to protest, like indignados and the whole idea of Stephen Hessem to a uh, time of outrage which got pretty popular and Occupy movement. But how do you think, to which extent, and the whole idea that the Protest with no positive agenda can't, can't work is also very usual. But what do you think about protest just to protest? Because sometimes people are just angry. And maybe they really don't want to, you know, they want just to show that they are angry and outraged and to challenge the status quo. So that would be my question. What would you think? Is it what we have, we experience now, how successful it can be uh, regarding the that and the second issue about the strategy, uh, of course, during the horizontal movements, 
And I tell why it's, I find it important, because in Ukraine, where you probably, you know, knowing that you've done the movie, uh, and explore the issue. Uh, the whole idea of protest was a lot discredited because all the other mass uh, activities or protest or resistance was used by some other politicians. So the, any idea when there is any smaller leader uh, is treated as if this all, uh, all activity is kind of a PR for this leader. So idea when there is, so everybody tries to step up really and in any kind when there is any like structure is trying to be built, everybody wants to step away and really not to kind of be used and not to be accused to becoming a, uh, as if they are self-promoting. So how do you think it's possible really to build a strategy and like generally what you're reflecting on that? Well, you know, again, we're always talking about probabilities, but a strategy to go to the street because you're angry, to let off steam, uh, recognizing you probably have a finite amount of steam, that's probably a not good use of your, your steam. Uh, and I, I don't believe that you should have it even consider a tactic without understanding its strategic context. Why wouldn't you just go out and do something without thinking it through? Um, with respect to when you tell me, well, the protest is not working. Now, this is one of the dangers of, oh, you mean, oh, you mean protest. So then somebody says, but the protest doesn't work. Therefore, civil resistance doesn't work. That's how these words really metastasize or turn into something that creates in people's minds something not useful. So you're telling me a protest today doesn't work so well. Well, what about a strike? What about a boycott? What about a dozen other things? If I'm a boxer and I'm sitting here and this guy's got a great left hook, you know, I'll take a couple of shots, but after a while I will circle to my left and circle to my left, keep my right hand up, and then hit him with something else. Not everything, tactics are not a strategy. Tactics are not a strategy. What makes a tactic have a strategic context is the forethought that comes to it. If you want to go out and just let off steam, you have no strategy. And my experience is no strategy is not a, not a formula for success. You have to have reasons for what you do. You know, um, and the military gets this. They really do. You know, I'm, some of you know I have a son who was in the military and before, and he wrote, he's a master's student here, he probably wrote over his time a thousand pages of papers. But I tell you, he wrote more when, as a combat officer, before he went out on any activity, he had to write a 40-page paper about what was the purpose, what was the risks, and on and on and on and on. We should submit ourselves to that same kind of discipline. If you don't do it, you're going to lose. Pardon my high tone. tone. But I mean, tactics without a strategy, it's the biggest reason we lose. You know? well, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment since you was uh, mentioning naming models. Uh, it's not uh, just a protest to protest. Yeah. Maybe it's like a bit more difficult to understand it uh, compared to like a dictatorship, but it's not just a protest strategy. But I, I agree that there, there is a lack of strategy. Right, right. So, um, anyway, what time is it? Thank you. <laughs>